Uh, welcome to episode 22 of the Quantum Science Seminar. Today is all going to be about quantum metrology. And as usual, we would like to have your questions. So please send us your questions via email to quantumscienceseminar at gmail.com or use the YouTube live chat at the right or at the bottom of the screen. We're going to take a break sometime in the middle of the talk and start answering some of these questions. And then uh, at the end, um, do the rest of the questions. Our speaker today has also very kindly agreed to stay on in, in our Zoom meeting uh, after the talk. And I will post the link to the Zoom meeting at the end of the talk into the YouTube chat. So please, if you would like to talk to Eugene, interact with us, come and join us. Also note that there's a 30 second time delay between what you're seeing on YouTube and between what we're doing. And with that, I'd like to hand over to Ofer, who's going to introduce our speaker today. Thank you, Sebastian, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Professor Eugene Poltik, head of the quantum optics and atomic physics division in the Niels Bohr Institute in the University of Copenhagen. Professor Poltik is an experimental quantum physicist who made many breakthrough contributions during his career. He was the first to demonstrate atomic spectroscopy with non-classical light, he generated for the first time a macroscopic non-classical matter state, namely a spin squeeze state of an ensemble of atoms by transferring to the atoms the quantum state of squeeze light. In 2004, he demonstrated the storage and retrieval of non-classical light. And by that, he realized an optical quantum memory, one of the holy grails in the field. He demonstrated the quantum teleportation between light and matter and later extended the process to realize teleportation between distant atomic ensembles. And more lately, much of his recent work and breakthroughs deal with quantum enhanced measurements, which is the topic of today's talk, and I will leave it to Eugene to discuss. Professor Poltik is a member of the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences. He held two ERC advance grants, and he is a Willum investigator of 2019. He received the Herbert Walder Award, the Gordon Moore Distinguished Scholar Award, the Scientific American Leadership Award, and many others. He is also a knight of the order Dannebrog and a great singer. So without further ado, it is a pleasure to host Professor Polzig today, who will talk about quantum mechanics in the negative mass reference frame. Eugene, thank you for coming, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Well, I have to say that uh, I really feel much more alive when uh, I give a talk like that and uh, compared to the normal lockdown life, it's almost as if I have traveled simultaneously to all your universities. So um, yeah, um, and I have to congratulate actually both Sebastian and Arthur. You guys have developed now a very professional kind of style of introducing. It's almost like I am listening to a professional radio station. Right. So quantum mechanics in the negative reference frame is our title. And let's start. Well, how do I start? I start like that. Right. So um, those two gentlemen, uh, Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg, 100 years ago, discussed quantum limits of measurement. And let's look at what they were thinking of uh, at the example of the so-called Heisenberg microscope. So here we are, and we wouldn't to, would like to kind of look at a particle. And if we want to look at a particle, that means that we have to scatter light from this particle. And let's say that we're scattering a photon. So we shine a photon and the photon gets into the telescope or microscope, whatever. But of course, this photon gives a kick to the particle. So the particle starts moving. That would be all right. But the point is that, of course, we know that light is a particle and a wave at the same time. And the better we focus this wave on the particle to see where it was, the larger will be the spread of the momentum that we give this particle because the tighter you focus light, the larger is the diffraction angle. So clearly, if you knew where the particle was, you don't know what 
uh, momentum kick you gave to this particle. And that gives rise to the very well known standard quantum limit of the free particle motion, which um, you can see here, right? So if the coordinate uh, as a function of time is the initial position and the initial momentum and the position and the momentum obey the uncertainty principle, then you can minimize the uncertainty as a function of time and you get something like that. And that would be a standard quantum limit for the observation of a free particle. So there is no free lunch. We are not able, at least given this uh, relatively basic um, consideration, we are not uh, capable of following the trajectory of a particle. And the rest of the talk will be to show you that, yes, we can. So to go further, let me remind you about another very basic story in quantum mechanics. And this is the einstein podolsky rosen entanglement back from 1935. So einstein podolsky and Rosen wrote the paper where we, uh, they said quantum mechanics allows us to have two particles entangled. And entanglement means that we know exactly the distance between the particles and the total momentum, because the, dis the difference of axes and the sum of p's commute. Therefore, we are able to know both those exactly. And that made them very unhappy because of the reasons which, in my opinion, had to do with Einstein's relativity story, because Einstein said, well, if we can have a free will to measure either x1 or p1, that then by this free will, we will collapse the second particle, either in the eigenstate of the position or the eigenstate of the momentum. And this collapse will happen instantaneously, irrespective of the distance to the particle. And since nothing can happen instantaneously in Einstein's view of the world, that would be a paradox. Well, not dwelling much on this interpretation, which we now are kind of very comfortable with. There is no contradiction because nothing here, no information travels faster than the speed of light. Uh, but such an entangled state is possible. And it is described by the well-known difference in the X and well-known sum of the P's. And uh, some 65 years ago, after the einstein podolsky rosen uh, two teams actually have written down an exact condition for the boundary between entangled and not entangled. And it's this factor of two on the right-hand side. And it simply comes from the fact that the commutator for X and P is I. And therefore, in the minimal uncertainty state, x1 variance is one half, one half, one half, and one half. So for two systems in the minimal uncertainty state, you get two. If it's less than two, they're entangled. So that would be sort of our baseline for the establishment of entanglement for the rest of the talk. Now, there are three steps that were identified to the noiseless quantum trajectories, that is to say, to tracing the path of a particle without limitations which are imposed by the naively perceived Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And those three steps are, first, you have to define this trajectory relative to a special reference frame. Second, this reference frame should have an effective negative mass. And in a minute, I will show you that this is not science fiction. Uh, such a system exists. Um, and the third thing is that one should be able to generate an entangled state between the reference frame with the effective negative mass and the probed system. And if you go through those three steps, then in the next slide, we will see 
that you are actually able to trace the motion of the particle without any limits. And here I give you some references to the recent and earlier papers to read about. So simple question, kind of uh, simple exercise in algebra essentially. And I even removed all the hats from those operators because uh, in this language of linear transformations, you can just think of those as simply algebraic val values and just don't forget the commutation relation. So let's assume that we have two systems, x, x naught, p, and p naught, and we want to measure this. We want to measure the position of the system x as a function of time with respect to the system X naught. So kinematics, first grade, well, maybe first year of the college. Uh, it's the difference between the positions and the time zero plus the difference between the derivatives times t. Now, the difference with the positions and the derivative of the position is the momentum if we take masses to be one. And uh, well, it doesn't bring us anywhere because the difference of the positions and the difference of the momenta don't commute. Therefore, in this simple situation, you still have the trajectory defined by non-commuting variables. But now, of course, you can see where I'm going because if now the reference frame has an effective negative mass, whatever it means, then this minus sign is exchanged into a plus and I get what I want. I get the difference of the positions, the sum of the momenta, they commute and therefore I can measure this as a function of time by simply continuously measuring the difference of the position, the sum of the momenta, and uh, off we go. So with this very simple algebraic consideration, you hopefully trust me that at least at the level of this trivial discussion, if I can come up with the negative mass reference frame, then I can measure the relative trajectory of my system in this reference frame without any limits. In the experimental um, discussion, at least in most of it, I will be dealing with oscillators rather than free particles. And exactly very similar story goes for an oscillator, except for, for an oscillator, in order to achieve my result, I need to assume three things. I need to assume the mass to be negative, the frequency to be negative, and the elasticity to be negative. So in this way, the product of the mass and the frequency are, is a positive number, so life is good. Um, for future reference, it would be convenient to look at those canonical variables of the position and the momentum. And for mechanical motion, they should be normalized according to the so-called zero point fluctuations. So what is a zero point fluctuation? If you cool a mechanical oscillator to the absolute zero, there will still be vacuum fluctuations. It will be still moving, believe it or not. And uh, the motion, for example, for a typical oscillator that we have will be of the order of one femtometer. It's a small number, but it's a number which can be easily measured. So this oscillator will be moving and we will discuss its motion with uh, dimensionless X and P normalized according to the zero point fluctuations. Still, we have the uncertainty principle. And what it means actually is that if I now start continuously monitoring this single oscillator 
then I get the following. In the laboratory frame, the position of this oscillator will be x operator sine omega t plus p times cosine omega t. That's a normal oscillator. And uh, let's see what happens. Those x and p are non-commuting variables. So imagine that at time, uh, at a certain initial time, my sine is one, cosine is zero. So I'm measuring x. I'm measuring x, but I'm putting back action in p. Now quarter period later, when in the phasor diagram, I moved from here to here. Now I'm measuring p. The back action from p came from the previous measurement. And now I'm measuring p and putting the back action into x. And we keep going. And the more we measure, the more we disturb our oscillator. We disturb it simply by the fact of the measurement. And yet, if we now take two oscillators and one of them with the effective negative mass, we can overcome this quantum back action of the measurement and do not see it. So the way it mathematically appears is that now I have an oscillator and I measure it with respect to another oscillator. So I will have the dis difference between the rotating frame axis and the sum of the rotating frame P's if the frequency of my reference oscillator can be considered negative. Again, commuting variables provide me the relative motion trajectory of the two systems. And it can be demonstrated actually that if the two systems are entangled, then I can measure them beyond the standard quantum limit. Okay, so what are the quantum oscillators that we will be actually dealing in the experiment and in this talk. One of them will be quite an interesting and not very conventional oscillator. It's a spin in the magnetic field. Hopefully we all know that if we put the spin in the magnetic field, then it will begin to process around the magnetic field with the Zeeman frequency, which will depend on the strength of the field. Um, in the quantum world, as you may remember, there is never the spin direction, which is defined perfectly well. In particular, if you have several spins, there will always be quantum uncertainties. And therefore, even if classically the spin is oriented like that, quantum mechanically, there will be quantum uncertainties and those quantum uncertainties will be spinning around the magnetic field. So this is our spin oscillator. This is a much more mundane thing, which is a mechanical oscillator. It can have different modes. And in fact, in the experiment, we will be dealing with pretty much this kind of membrane oscillator. Finally, light, of course, is also an oscillator and uh, it has cosine and sine components according to the phase. And in our experiments, light will be connecting spins and mechanics. So the mechanical oscillator is our normal oscillator. The spin oscillator will play the role of the negative mass oscillator and light will provide the interaction between the two, which will lead to entanglement and to measurements beyond the quantum limits. Okay, so we take a deep breath and uh, look now at things from the experimental perspective. Um, we deal with rather special uh, and uh, in some sense unique mechanical oscillator, which is this little 
membrane, we call a defect in the middle of a rather elaborate structure. The whole size is like three by three millimeters. Why is this so complex? Because we want this little drum, which oscillates at about one megahertz frequency all by itself. We want it to be very well isolated from the rest of the world. And why? This is because we want to have a very, very high quality factor of this oscillator because the quality factor essentially tells you how strongly this oscillator is connected to the outside world. And we don't want it to be connected to the outside world because the outside world is hot and dirty. And we want this oscillator to begin with to be in its ground state. So um, as I said, it's about one megahertz frequency. So at 300 Kelvin, the oscillations, thermal oscillations will be about a picometer. If we cool it to zero Kelvin, it will be about a femtometer. Now we want light to interact with this oscillator. How do we do that? We take this oscillator, let's see if I can make it oscillate. Yes, I can. And uh, we put this membrane it's not exactly like that, right? So it's like a drum, but I cannot draw a drum. So we put it between two mirrors and we shine light on it. There is a standing wave here and we place this membrane not in the zero and not in the maximum, but somewhere in between. Now what we have is a piece of dielectric which moves in the standing wave. So what happens? is that this piece of the electric, when it moves, it changes, it modulates light, right? Because if I change the dielectric, if I change the position of the dielectric in the standing wave, obviously I change the effective index of refraction for this whole thing. So as a result, there will be side bands generated on the frequency of this light at the frequency of the mechanical motion. It's like a small acousto-optic modulator. Let's look now at the resonance of this optical resonator. So this is optical frequency now. Suppose to begin with, the frequency of light is tuned above the central frequency of this resonator. And the sidebands that I'm talking about, they are at plus minus one megahertz, which is this frequency. Now, in the picture that I've given here, the red sideband will be happily built up, whereas the blue sideband will be seriously suppressed. So that essentially means that there will be efficient scattering of this drive into the red sideband. So the higher frequency of the laser will be converted for some photons into the lower frequency of the sideband. So that means that according to um, energy conservation, the energy which came out from the scattering should go somewhere. And it goes into generating a phonon, a quantum, of motion. So in the Hamiltonian language, it will be creation of a red photon and creation of the phonon. If I now tune my laser on the other side, I will have a creation of a blue phonon, photon and annihilation of the phonon because energy should come from somewhere. So this is essentially what you get in two minutes as the basics of the so-called quantum optomechanics. Finally, if I move my laser exactly on resonance, then both, system, both processes have the same weight. And so I will have something which is called quantum non-demolition interaction, but that's kind of details. Now, if I do this exact experiment and start looking 
at the noise of light, which is imposed by the motion of the membrane. And this is the spectrum. So because of this wonderful phononic band gap structure, I have very clean spectrum around the mechanical resonance of this central membrane. Therefore, I wonderfully well see the peak. And this peak, as it can be demonstrated, is essentially due to the quantum back action of light on this membrane. And in simple terms, this quantum back action is just the radiation pressure of photons which exert random force on this membrane. And here is the spectrum blown up. You can see that this is the dominated quantum back action and the almost ground state noise is barely visible. So we are in a good shape here. We are in the situation where the quantum back action is dominating. We have strong measurement which means that we're in a good position to start back action cancellation and entanglement. That's the layout of the actual experiment. The membrane sits there. And now the second system, the atomic spin system, which has this effective negative mass property. So we have lots of atoms Let's say that they are spin one halves for simplicity. And let's say that we are orienting all of them along the magnetic field. So on the Bloch sphere, you can think of them as just those spins, which are all looking up. So the commutation relation for the two orthogonal projections of the spin is given by that. And Jz is the large and classical value, so I divide by that. And what I get is that I have the same commutation relation for renormalized projections on the orthogonal axis. And therefore, I can think of this as an oscillator. And uh, if I look at the north pole of this oscillator, it would look like that if it's in the ground state. And if I generate the first excited state of this oscillator, which if you remember quantum mechanics would look like a Fox state, then you would believe me that because of the curvature of this block sphere, this state is closer to the South Pole than that one, simply because it's bigger which means obviously also from this picture that the first excited state of this oscillator has the energy which is below the ground state. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome the negative mass oscillator. That's all it is. And now you put the magnetic field and this whole thing begins to spin around. And so now we have a negative mass oscillator normal mechanical positive mass oscillator and we're ready to go. This is just our incarnation of this atomic oscillator. It's a large collection of atoms held in this little channel. Atoms are in the magnetic field, they can move around, but we don't care much because they are in some protecting environment. So we can tune the frequency of this oscillator because it's just tuned by the magnetic field and we can initiate it in the negative mass reference frame. So I think at this point, I'm ready to take questions. Okay, so uh, we have uh, quite some questions. So first of all, there's a question from Jakov Yudkin from, the, from email that says, uh, doesn't negative mass imply imaginary zero point uh, fluctuation length? So mm -hmm. oscillator length, how should this be understood? Yes, so note, I said that the mass is negative, the frequency is negative and the elasticity is negative. So it's not an unstable oscillator. 
it's a stable. If, if only one of those would be negative, then the frequency would in fact be imaginary and then this thing will just diverge. Exactly like the question kind of assumes, but it's not the case. Then we have another question uh, from the chat, uh, from Shruti, uh, that would like to know whether you could explain a little more on how the balancing of the two terms of the Hamiltonian is a non-demolition measurement. Huh. Right, um, so if you now take this coefficient and this coefficient to be equal and add Hermitian conjugate, then it will be a dagger b dagger plus a dagger b plus a b dagger plus a b. <laughs> you can rewrite this whole thing through canonical operators, which is a plus a dagger and b plus b dagger. And a plus a dagger is the x canonical variable and b plus b dagger is the x light canonical variable. Now you have the Hamiltonian, which is a product of two canonical variables. If you apply this Hamiltonian to the dynamics, you will actually see that, of course, both x and x of the mechanics and x of light, they commute with the Hamiltonian and therefore they are conserved. So that in some sense uh, is the quantum and demolition part of it, that you can measure the thing without uh, changing it. Uh, the P variables, of course, will change. And this is a, a little longer story. So we have uh, yet another question from the YouTube chat from Abraham Hernandez that would like to know which property of light carries information from the spin to the membrane. Radiation mm -hmm. pressure or something else? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. Um, let me address it when I start talking about the schematic at large. I will remember. Mm -hmm. And then I think we can uh, get another question. So when we talk about negative masses, it immediately makes one think of negative mass of electrons or other particles in lattices at the edge of a block band. Can we think about a particle at the top of a block band as an example of the dynamics you are talking here of negative uh, mass? And are there potential example realizations based on this? Yes. Um, I wouldn't bet my fortune on that. I'm not a solid state physicist, but I know that uh, people have looked at the uh, electron positron pairs as positive and negative mass uh, things. I also know that if you Google uh, Pierre Maestri and um, his uh, works about six, seven, eight years ago, they looked at the Bose-Einstein condensate and they found their examples of the effective negative mass systems. So the answer is yes, there are other systems indeed. Okay, so there are actually other questions, but maybe for the sake of time, we can take them uh, right. at the end. Very good. So now regarding uh, the measurements, uh, we spoke about the measurements on the mechanical system. Remember we shine light on this thing and then this light interacts with the system and uh, I will talk a little bit more about it when we look at the system. Now, this is the measurement of the spin. And uh, suppose we have linearly polarized light, which is impinging on the spin system. The spin system is classically oriented along the vertical axis. But as I said, quantum mechanically, there is always uncertainty. And so in the magnetic field, the quantum projections of the spin, which serve the role of X and P in our case, will be oscillating like that. And of course, if I send linearly polarized light into such a system, then the polarization of light will begin to oscillate 
according to the projection of the spin on the direction of propagation, which oscillates. So this is again, referring a little bit to the question that uh, was asked. Uh, so if you want to couple light quantum mechanically to the spin, then you need to have strong linearly polarized drive and the quantum fluctuations of this light will on the one hand reflect the spin and on the other hand affect the spin. So it will be like in phase and out of phase components of vacuum fluctuations, which will be measured and at the same time mapped on the atomic spin. So those oscillations of course can be measured and uh, you take them on the detector, you put them on the locking amplifier, you look at the cosine and sine components and because the cosine and sine components of this rotation will be simply the uh, projections of the spin and the rotating frame and as we agreed one cannot measure them without the back action. The longer you measure, the more back action you see and off we go. Here is the story. The spectrum of noise of this measurement. Now I'm looking at the cosine square plus sine square, but it doesn't matter. So this is the back action dominated spectrum of noise. And this is the ground state spin noise. So now we have two systems they're both dominated by the quantum back action and we can put them together. So that's the photo of the atomic system. The atomic cell sits inside this triple shield to protect it from the external magnetic fields. And uh, we take light, we send it through the atomic spin system and the uh, mechanical oscillator between the two mirrors. So to the question, what properties of light carry information about quantum state of the systems? So you start here with the, let's say strongly linearly polarized light and vacuum fluctuations in the other polarizations. It goes through and because of this, remember we talked about it, because of the um, continuous measurement, the cosine and sine components of the orthogonal polarization now bear quantum fluctuations due to the spin. So in some sense, you can say that this light is now entangled with those spins. And then it goes further. Now we strip off the orthogonal polarization because the membrane doesn't care about uh, orthogonal polarization. And we instead put the polarization for the drive, which is the same as the quantum fluctuations, which came from here. And now we are driving the membrane with phase and amplitude fluctuations of light, which came from polarization fluctuations here. And finally, we make a measurement and uh, go from there. Those two you have already seen, the two systems. So um, the first experiment to discuss is the quantum back action evasion. Uh, we have our mechanical oscillator. We have our negative mass spin oscillator where the first excited state is below the ground state. And uh, this is a little technical slide, but at least for the people who are in the field, let me mention that besides choosing the right uh, signs of the masses, you have to choose and tune the interaction strength. And the key for the atomic ensemble to observe large quantum back action is simply the resonant optical depth. 
And for the mechanics, ideally, the situation is even simpler. You just need to have strong, coherent drive, and then you will get to the quantum back action limited regime. Of course, in reality, it's not as simple as that because here we neglect dissipation, and this is only true if you have very high Q factor. But you can match the responses of those two systems. And if you do so and start measuring now, those two are in some sense what you have already seen before. Note that this is the log scale. So this is the measurement on the membrane only. And it's completely dominated by the quantum back action, which is this uh, crossed area. And the spin at the moment is tuned away from the frequency of the mechanics. So they're completely independent. And again, we are dominated by the quantum back action, not as much as here, but again, it's the log scale. So the back action is very strong. And now we take this Zeeman frequency and move it on resonance. And what we see is an extremely strong reduction of this quantum back action. The reduction is 6 dB, which is four times. So if you compare the sum of those two back actions with the resulting back action with the negative mass reference frame, you have it four times smaller. And if I would have shown you the results for the positive mass atoms, which simply means that I uh, change the direction of optical pumping or change the direction of the magnetic field. Then instead of four times smaller back action, you would have it probably six times larger. So the necessary condition of suppression of the quantum back action with the joint measurement between the normal oscillator and the negative mass oscillator works. And now we can proceed and try to look at the entanglement. So those are the heroes of the lab and the lab itself. And uh, now we go ahead and demonstrate the entangled state by simply continuous measurement on the system. So in the ideal case scenario, we would be measuring the relative positions of those two oscillators. And we would observe that the variance of this measurement goes down, down, down to zero. Well, of course, as in any real experiment, it doesn't go to zero. But before I show you the results, let me just give you a rather intuitive picture, in my opinion, of how you can visualize this entanglement. So we're now in the P and X uh, canonical reference frame. Let's say even that our mechanical oscillator is not in the ground state. Let's say that the ground state is this, but our mechanical oscillator is actually relatively noisy. It has some thermal occupation. The spin oscillator is much easier to put in the ground state. So let's assume that it's a ground state. Now, what happens with the mechanical oscillator as a function of time? It jumps all over the place because the phonons are exchanging between the oscillator and the environment. But if you do experiment fast enough, then you can simply assume that it's frozen somewhere inside the uh, thermal uncertainty. So what? how fast is fast? Well, a fraction of the millisecond is OK, because the time without a jump is approximately this. So now we make a measurement and create an entanglement. This will be quantum back action on one oscillator. This is quantum back action on the other oscillator. And the visualization of the entanglement is exactly this. You don't know the realization 
of each of those oscillators as a function of time. But you know that they are always anti-correlated in X, sorry, correlated in X and anti-correlated in P. So whatever they are, you don't know where each of them is, but you know that they are very strongly correlated, stronger than the uh, vacuum state of each of them. Um, I think I will have to skip this slide. It's a little technical. This is how we infer entanglement by doing the so-called Wiener filtering. You have to trust me that we can infer the entanglement. Um, this is actually quite interesting, I think, because this is the real time. Well, not real time, it's a little slower, but this is the two trajectories of the oscillators. And you can see that this is the uh, standard quantum limit of the ground state uncertainty. And look what's happening with those two. They move around like crazy. But they're always inside, well inside the uh, ground state uncertainty. Um, this is the published result. Despite all our heroic efforts, losses and other imperfections only allowed us to demonstrate entanglement of about 20% below the uh, limit. Here is not entangled, here is entangled. Well, we hope to improve this result further. It's really only limited by passive losses and imperfect ground state. Well, I think I have probably maybe a few minutes more, right? Uh -huh. So I'm doing well in time, which allows me actually to tell you about our most ambitious goal with such a system. And that is to go out and help the people who don't need any help. They already got the Nobel prize, but still. so. The most sensitive device, well, arguably the most sensitive, I think, device in measuring motion nowadays is a gravitational wave detector. Those are humongous instruments built, two of them in the US, one in Italy, another one in Japan is coming up and so on. And they can measure tiny, fluctuations of space, which are uh, produced by the merge of two neutron stars, creating a black hole and sending around ripples of gravitational waves at the speed of light. And by the time when those ripples come to Earth, they're so tiny that it's unbelievable. How are they measured? They are measured with the so-called gravitational wave detectors, which is actually, as you recognize it, simply a Maxander interferometer. So light comes in, reflects here, and this is a big mirror, which is suspended in such a way that the tiny change coming from the gravitational wave can actually rock it. And in the other arm, it goes here. There is another mirror and it comes back and now they interfere. Why such geometry? Such a geometry is there because the gravitational wave is a quadruple wave. So it changes the space in kind of ellipsoid fashion. It shrinks is in this way and uh, expands in this way and the other way around. Therefore, in this interferometer, when this mirror moves this way, this mirror moves that way. And so they unbalance the interferometer. Right, so this is what happens when the gravitational wave comes. And without any kind of quantum uh, noise cancellation, this is where those guys are. And uh, what I show you here 
is the sensitivity of this interferometer as a function of the frequency of the disturbance. Gravitational waves tend to be localized in their frequency in the tens of hertz and hundreds of hertz and sometimes in the kilohertz range. So you want to have low noise in this entire band. However, as we discussed throughout the talk, the more light you send into this interferometer, of course, the better you can measure the position, obviously. On the other hand, if you send a lot of light, you exert a lot of radiation pressure and a lot of quantum back action. And so by simply sending kilowatts of light into this thing, you are disturbing those mirrors in such a way that they don't see gravitational waves very well. This is reflected in this purple curve, which is the stem quantum limit. At low frequencies, that is long duration, the system is limited by the radiation pressure because there is a lot of photons which are rocking those mirrors. At higher frequencies, the system is dominated by the phase noise, which is simply you don't have enough time to measure and therefore you have short noise fluctuations. And in between, you have this minimum and you cannot go below that unless you do tricks. And one of the tricks that we suggest to do has to do, with, so this is, you already seen, this is the standard quantum limit. And uh, what we suggest to do in a nutshell is to take our atomic ensemble system with a negative mass and place it somewhere inside this interferometer and hope that this little thing surrounded by a lot of optics <laughs> and uh, skillful people will play the role of the noise eater, so to say. And this will simply be because the atoms will play a role of the negative mass oscillator with the negative susceptibility. And when you take the positive susceptibility of the normal interferometer oscillator and add it with the negative susceptibility, you hope to get the noise reduction across the band. So that's just telling you what I just told you with, again, this issue of the uh, negative mass oscillator. So if the mass is negative here, then this minus goes into a plus and you have two commuting operators and you can measure with arbitrary accuracy. In real life, it's not so easy. You also need an entangled source of light because cesium atoms want to talk to this color and LIGA people <laughs> want to talk with this color. So we cannot just send one and the same beam of light as we do in the lab because our membrane doesn't care which color to send, but we have to generate entangled light and send one of them through the atomic system. And the other one, so far, not through the LIGA because nobody lets us do it, but through a system which will kind of mimic the LIGA in some sense. So according to our hopefully realistic estimates, we can improve the broadband sensitivity of LIGA if they let us touch it by a factor of two across the entire band. And the factor of two is actually the factor of eight in the volume of the universe that you can cover. Yeah, so we're building our tabletop system consisting of entangled light and the atomic noise eater and hope to surprise the world. Right, so Trajectories in the negative mass reference frame, no uncertainties. You want to measure, you measure. Thank you for your attention.
So thank you very much for this uh, very beautiful talk. So there are actually quite some questions still uh, uh, to your presentation. So first of all, we have Wen Chao Tzu from the YouTube chat that would like to understand why the ground state is the North Pole and not the South Pole in the block sphere. Right. So uh, the ground state is defined as the state with no excitations. And um, if I initialize my spins in this state, then on the block sphere, it will be here. So, um, Right? It will be there simply because it's the highest energy. If all of them would be here, then this thing will be looking down to the South Pole and it will be a ground state of the positive mass oscillator because the first excitation will lift the state. Here, the ground state with no excitations is the highest energy, that's all. So very good, we have another question from Christoph Salomon that would like to know why a factor of two only uh, win in LIBOR, why not more actually? Um, so um, as a kind of what? As a lesson of life to younger generation, if you can publish a factor of two today, don't wait until you get a factor of 10. Publish a factor of two today, and then in a year you can publish a factor of 10. That will be much easier than to wait. It's simply on a more serious note, it's because of losses. Optical, you know, we're talking here about the Gaussian entanglement. And Gaussian entanglement, like Gaussian squeezing, it's ultra sensitive to losses. So, you have seen the experiment. This experiment has a zillion optical elements. And um, with very good effort, we have 40% losses between the two systems. So now we are going to rebuild the system and hopefully have maybe 10% losses between the two systems. So that would be the next step. So also a bit of a technical question. So when coupling the magnetic oscillator to the mechanical oscillator, does the magnitude of the shot noise of the atoms have to be matched to the quantum noise of the mechanical oscillators for both to cancel? This is a very good question and the answer is yes. But the point is, what, what does it mean that they are matched? So what it means is that when I make my measurement on the composite system, so let me just see, maybe I have something like that in the auxiliary slides. Well, maybe I will just simply explain it in words. Um, no, actually this will be the a good explanation here. So this is the result of the measurement on the mechanics. This is the level of shot noise. Well, sorry, the, the level of the shot noise is the baseline, forgive me. Um, the ground state noise is here and the back action is this. So we should in some way balance the size of the quantum back action on the uh, mechanical system in units of shot noise to the size of the back action on atoms also in units of shot noise. That would essentially mean that we are balancing the responses of the two oscillators. 
And then maybe uh, just before ending, there is uh, yet another question on the LIGO uh, improvement. So the SQL can be surpassed in gravitational wave detectors by using squeeze, squeeze light. So mm -hmm. how does its performance compare to your proposal? Mm -hmm. It's a very good question. And uh, the answer consists of two parts. One part is the simple experiment, which they have already actually doing, I believe, or will be doing very soon. They inject squeezed light at, into the interferometer. But um, squeezed light can be either squeezed in the phase or in the amplitude. And if it's squeezed in the phase, it's anti-squeezed in the amplitude. And if it's squeezed in the amplitude, it's anti-squeezed in phase. So you cannot just using simple squeezed light drive this whole thing down. You either go down here and up here or down here and up here. Operationally, what they're doing is that they're using squeezing in the amplitude. And in this way, they're simply kind of moving this curve as a whole to the left. And then that means that they can use less power and get the same response. And this is good for them. In order to get the broadband reduction, you really must have the frequency dependent quantum fluctuations reduction. It can be in principle also achieved with squeezed light, but then you need to rotate the phase of squeezing between the frequency of 100 Hertz and the frequency of 20 Hertz by pi over two. You can do it by building a 300 meter long reference cavity and maybe they will do it. We are offering a comparative solution which is two square meters breadboard. We'll see what happens. And then a very, very last question, actually. Christophe Salomon asks again, so whether you should not extend the measurement dur duration from 0.3 milliseconds to a few milliseconds if you want to work on this gravitational wave detection. First of all, my best regards and uh, greetings to Christophe. Really glad, you know, to, to hear from him. And uh, the answer is absolutely yes. And uh, that essentially means that uh, our atomic oscillator now will be at the frequency of 50 Hertz and not one and a half megahertz. And uh, indeed, we will have to enhance the lifetime of our spins significantly. On paper, it is possible. We'll see. So thank you very much for this beautiful talk. And I think we have to stop here, even though there are still questions for the sake of time. So I give the word back to Sebastian. Yeah, thank you also, Eugene, from my side. Very cool talk. So uh, just to remind everybody, next week on October 29th, we will have yet another talk by Martin Plenio, who will speak about color centers in diamond. If you want to get notified about what we're doing and um, other talks that we're going to be showing you, please go to our website, quantumscienceseminar.com. You can subscribe to our email list there. You can subscribe to our Google calendar. You can follow us on Twitter. And you should certainly check out our sister seminar, the virtual AMO seminar, where tomorrow they will have their very first postdoc session where Ivan Kuziriev will be speaking about molecules and Matteo Ippoliti will be speaking about time crystals. If you want to join us for a Q&A session with Eugene, please dial in with, uh, into Zoom using the link that I just pasted into the YouTube chat window. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your interest and we hope to see you again next week. Same time, same place. Sebastian, wait. Yes. yes. Can I still address the audience? Absolutely, please. So once in a lifetime opportunity, we will have PhD and postdoc opening in both atomic part and optomechanics part. So if you feel like joining this effort, please write to me.
Absolutely. And please, uh, if you don't know where to find Eugene's uh, webpage, go to our website. The link is right there. And uh, see you in a bit and the Q&A session if you'd like.